And good evening, Second Baptist Church. Glad to be with you tonight here on this August the 5th uh, and uh, Wednesday night. Be glad when this uh, at-home midweek stuff is done too. Uh, it's just not the same, not seeing you, but it was great to be in our place Sunday morning. We will be in our place again this Sunday morning in the same manner that we were this week. We talked a little bit at the end of service after the cameras and everything uh, were off Sunday about uh, what we can do. We've had some time to think about that. And before Sunday, uh, we'll be able to, to hopefully have a plan formulated that accommodates all of the different nuances that we have to think about with this. So thank you again for your patience and your concern as we have walked through this. Each church that I know of has walked through it just a little bit differently. And uh, each church's uh, dynamic is different. The constitution of that church is different as is ours. And uh, so we're praying, we're seeking God. Hopefully we're hearing him and uh, doing what he had to say. Um, uh, I'll pass my apologies along if you were watching live Sunday morning. You've already seen this as we posted later um, on, on the social media, but the internet uh, quit, quit on us at the church. And so uh, we weren't able to keep the live stream going but uh, uh, we did uh, do a follow-up post uh, later on with a close to full video. Um, I believe we just put that up on YouTube. So if you need to see the end of that sermon, you can go there and see that. Let's begin tonight uh, here on the 5th of August with Second Baptist Church with a psalm. Psalm number 4. In the 4th Psalm, God's Word says this, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have revived me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long, O sons of men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love the worthlessness and seek falsehood? And Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Selah. Offer sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart more than the seasons uh, that uh, more than the seasons that their grain and wine increased, I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And may God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of the fourth psalm. And it is awesome to get to open God's word and to read it with you tonight. And uh, a great hymn uh, r reminds me of that psalm as well as I look at it and I and I see what's going on with that psalm and and tonight's hymn is is a newer hymn in fact uh, the copyright is uh, 1979 is the copyright on this particular hymn and it's and it's given um, uh, by what is her name I I, I make the, the print so small when I put the names um, Linda Lee Johnson and Tom Fetke uh, wrote this hymn, and it's called uh, Together at Second Baptist Church, but I just love the words. I love what it says, how it says it. Uh, the, the, the hymn writer writes these words. Be strong in the Lord and be of good courage. You, your mighty defender is always the same. Mount up with wings as eagles ascending. Victory is sure. When you call on his name, be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and be of good courage, for he is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and rejoice, for the victory is yours. So put on the armor the Lord has provided and place your defense in his unfailing care. Trust him, for he will be with you in battle, lighting your path to avoid every snare. Be strong in the Lord and be of good courage. Your mighty commander will vanquish the foe. Fear not the battle, for the victory is always his. 
He will protect you wherever you go. Be strong. Be strong. Be strong in the Lord and be of good courage for he is your guide. Be strong. Be strong. Be strong in the Lord and rejoice for the victory is yours. Great hymn, Be Strong in the Lord, written in 1979. And it's in our hymnal today. And it is a beautiful, beautiful reminder of how we should live. It'll be part of our uh, of our work through Scripture tonight when uh, we, we open God's Word back to Genesis and we see where uh, Jacob, another, another story in the life of Jacob that is very, very familiar for us. And uh, we'll look at that in the 28th chapter of uh, Genesis here in, in just a moment. When we do, I want to remind you of an event that is going on in our community. Um, and it is the fourth annual Omogi uh, County Back to School Prayer Walk. It'll take place August the 8th uh, this year, beginning at Harmon Stadium, uh, 6, 699 East 12th Street in Omogi. From 9 to 9.30, have a meet, greet, a time of worship at 9.30. We'll head out to the different school locations and mm -hmm. begin to pray. Other counties have, have taken some of this on and, and praying for the schools in their areas. Perhaps you're not in Okmulgee proper, and so uh, you you would uh, maybe a group of you would want to meet at your local school in your local community, and, and go pray for your schools as school time is about to have to kick off. The question is, how's it going to kick off? So many variables. Uh, is it going to be virtual classroom? Uh, one of our neighboring communities has determined, and unless that determination has been changed again, that they're going to go strictly virtual for the first term. Uh, some schools, such as here in the city of Okmulgee, are offering both classroom and virtual classroom to uh, the students for school. Some are offering only traditional classroom, and, and others, to varying degrees, are, are doing different things. But uh, I, I'd just like you to remember our teachers and our administrators, our, our, our bus drivers, uh, and and uh, all of those that are involved because uh, there is an uncertainty. There's an uncertainty about how school is going to go this year um, and, and whether we'll be able to remain in the classroom, whether illnesses will push us out, whether the, the, the uh, current sickness, the pandemic that we uh, are watching uh, come into play come into play and are a part, certainly it will. Uh, the CDC guidelines, the State Board of Education guidelines, the city and local boards as they meet, the local principals as they meet with their staff in their local buildings to try to figure out what they're doing. Uh, for goodness sake, it's going to be difficult and it's going to be a day-by-day -day thing and, and not any one single person is making these decisions. Remember, it's not even the classroom teacher making these decisions. So be kind to your classroom teachers, especially. Um, and uh, if a bus comes by and picks up your children and, and requires something before that child's allowed on the bus, it might even uh, not be allowed to, to, to let a particular child on the bus. Whatever it is, uh, be kind and be patient, be gentle, because this is all new to everybody in schools and they need our prayer. And so on the, on the uh, 8th of August, here in the city of Okmulgee at the football stadium, Harmon Stadium. We will meet at 9 o'clock in the morning for meet, greet, and worship time. Head out to the school sites. We'll be praying for all of these things that I just mentioned. If you can't make it to the event itself, would you please join together with those who will be at the event and at 9.30 heading out to the school locations uh, to pray uh, there and, and uh, probably till about 11 o'clock or so. And where you are, you, know, you spend some time and pray for those who are, are involved in the education processes and decisions that need to be made wherever, <clears throat> wherever you are in, in your local community. And so please, please, please do that. Very important. And while you're praying for that, throw in a prayer for your church leaders. Because as difficult as it is to make the decisions for the children of an entire town, um, certainly it is comparable to make decisions for a, a, an entire church and to, to be able to, to lead as God would lead in that. So uh, I, as a church leader and as one who works in the education process, as a school bus driver, <laughs> that's a, a small role, but that's my role. 
um, we covet your prayers in those things. Well, let's turn to God's word for a few minutes tonight, if you will. I haven't even looked at the computer to see how we're doing. We've got some folks on 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 the audio stream, and I'm glad that you guys are there. Looks like we have um, uh, several people, several households joining us here in uh, in in uh, the video side of things. Uh, looks like a lot of you. Wow. Um, oh, one of my favorite places, Cheyenne, Wyoming, is coming in tonight. I love Cheyenne, Wyoming. I've got some really good friends, and God's allowed Flame of Fire Ministry to do some some work there in Cheyenne. Uh, a pastor in our local area, in fact, has come from Cheyenne, and uh, uh, just some good stuff going going on there. I, I would encourage you, if you have your copy of God's Word, not just to wait for me to read it to you, but to take your copy and open to uh, the first book of the Bible, which is Genesis. We're going to continue to be in Genesis for some time now. I don't think that we will complete the 50th chapter before we take another break. We're on our third installment in Genesis, and uh, we have looked at, at the life of, of the original creation, Adam and Eve and, and Noah, that, that era. We've looked at the era of Abraham. We have looked at the era and, and, and are still overlapping uh, some of the era of Isaac and now into the life of Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob being the three major patriarchs of our faith. And we, we need to know about them and we need to see their humanity and we need to see how God used them, how God spoke to them, and how God loved them. So in the 28th chapter of Genesis is where we find ourselves tonight. And as we look at this chapter in Genesis and, and we see a, a, a really intriguing story in, uh, in the life of Jacob, before we even read it and before we get to the ladder coming down out of heaven and angels going up and angels going down. I want to let you know right up front, and, and, and I address it now because I don't want to address it in the midst of the study, um, that no, I don't believe that was a UFO and that these were alien beings in the sense that we think of them. They're alien beings to us. They're angels. They're not of this world of this time and space in which we live, but uh, alien beings in the way we would think of them from Star Trek or Star Wars or, or other space movies and things like that. It, please don't read that into this passage as we're talking about that, okay? I just wanted to say that at the beginning because I've heard so many people and even read in commentaries today, uh, looking, looking at finalizing my, my notes for this lesson tonight, and, and there are people who believe that, more power to you if you want to believe that, but I don't believe that. That's not what the Word says. If it is the case, uh, then, uh, then, then God has not shown us that part of it. And as we look at the Word of God, we need to be content. And here's why I bring it up. We need to be content to not be able to explain some things. We need to be content to not be able to explain some things. Here we are in my home, and if the camera were to turn um, over to uh, what would be your left over to my right, there are six bookcases with one, two, three, four, five shelves each, all full of books to help me understand the Bible. I have that many books or more in my office, and I have that many books or more in another office or in boxes elsewhere that help me understand the Bible. And I, I, by the way, I've not read every page of every one of those by any means, but, but we, we, we should try to, to understand the Bible. Uh, Timothy was told to study to show yourself approved unto God. Well, study what? Study Scripture. Be diligent in Scripture. Make, make it something that you do with intensity to understand Scripture. And the more time you have to dedicate to that, the more time you should dedicate to that. And some people have, have more time. Uh, obviously, as a pastor, I would have quite a bit of time to dedicate to that because it's my job. But if I were a civil engineer building bridges, I might not have as much time. But as much time as I have, I should dedicate to being diligent to to understand and to know the word of God so that I may show myself approved to him, a workman who needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing 
the word of truth. And so the end of that passage in Timothy brings us to tell us what we're studying and, and what we're being diligent in. We're being diligent in the word of truth. What's the word of truth? The, the truth of God. It is, it is in, in today's time, the reference to that would have to be to our Bible so that we would know it. The Bible's a precious thing. People all over the world would love to have multiple copies of it like we do. But some people in the world would love to have a single copy. Some people in the world would cherish a single page. But here in our culture, in, in our country, most of us, even those who don't, don't uh, participate in a church, would say that they have a full copy of the Bible. And probably there are, are few people who have one copy that don't have at least two or three different kinds or different copies around. We need to get into it. We need to study it. But we need to be okay if we can't explain or understand every nuance of it. We're coming to one of those things tonight. And so it's okay if we can't do that. It, that that's one of those things that I believe God's left there for our faith. So that we can have faith in the God who gave to us the text of the scripture, the book wherein he has chosen to speak to man, that we should hear and, and, and read and study and listen reverently. And, and especially as we do so together, because it is the word of God and it's been given to us and it is proven true over and over again. Even the parts that we can't explain fully. And we need to be okay with those things. We come to chapter 28 of Genesis. Uh, hopefully uh, with that last ramp, you have had time to find the 28th chapter. And we will begin with verse 10 here in just a moment. Genesis, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 28 and verse 10. Uh, the background to get us to this point of scripture is uh, that Jacob had again, with the urging of his mother, um, tricked his way into receiving that which had been promised and was rightfully his brother Esau's. Um, and in so doing, the anger of Esau was so great that he said, I will kill my brother. Well, Rebecca, their mother, was not content to have to mourn the both of them at one time, uh, Jacob having been killed by Esau and Esau having been killed because of his killing of his brother Jacob. And so she sent Jacob away. She sent him uh, what would end up toward uh, the land of Haran, uh, back to the land where Rebekah's family was, the family of Abraham, um, and before he came out into the promised land. And he sent him there under the guise of going to Isaac and telling him so to, to find himself a wife so that they would be safe and so that things would be good. But to Jacob, she said, I'm going to send you here so that you will be safe so that I won't have to mourn the loss of my sons and, and like that. And so in verse 10, Jacob went out from Beersheba. And he went toward Haran. And in the midst of that journey, about 50 miles or so away from Beersheba, we'll find out because the location is given to us. Verse number 11, he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on earth, and its top reached into heaven, and there were angels of God descending and ascending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. And we'll pause there. We'll get into some more of these verses here as we go on, but I don't want to get so far in that we lose our place, that we lose our track in, in the account as it's been given to us here in, in Scripture. Now, we are about 50 miles or so away from Beersheba, which had become the home place of Isaac and Rebekah, their sons Jacob and Esau, and uh, those around them. Uh, this could have been a day's journey, but it would have been a very long day's journey, so it may have been more than one day. Again, when we look at scripture, the timing of the, of the verses, we got to be careful that we don't read into them a timing that's not given to us. 
we do know it's 50 miles journey. And to go 50 miles in a day would have been 12 or 15 hours of long walking if they're at foot traffic. And, and uh, if they're riding on animals, maybe 50 miles a day could have been done. But uh, <clears throat> he's on his way. And he's, and he's going there. He found a stone. I used to picture this when I was a child learning this lesson in, in Sunday school as, as he used a stone for a pillow, but the word says that he put it at his head. It would not have been an uncommon thing to take a warm stone from the fire that had been used for cooking and to put it near the place where you're going to sleep to help you be warm as you're falling to sleep. And in that place, he had this dream that I referred to a moment ago. Hear, hear it again how it is ex explained in Scripture, verse number 12. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on earth, its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Hmm. Interesting. Now, remember, mm -hmm. he said this was in a dream. Was it a reality? Was it a real depiction of what happens? And and do angels really climb up and down on a ladder? Maybe in today's world, he would have seen an escalator moving up and down or an elevator or something uh, moving up and down uh, in, in, in that way. As some have alluded, there are some really strange uh, things that have been given as, as uh, explanations for what this is. Interesting, um, uh, interesting thoughts have been given. And, and by the way, I don't, I don't uh, discourage trying to think things out like that. Hmm, a ladder, and angelic beings going up and going down into heaven. Uh, you know, how could that be? What would that have looked like? Was it a big wide ladder so that they could, some of them be going up and some of them be going down at the same time and they're passing one another, you know, stay to the right or stay to the left, I guess, if you're uh, in Europe. And I wonder what that looked like. What did that dream look like? But more importantly, did it have some significance that Jacob would need to realize because of what God was about to tell him? Did God manipulate the dream of Jacob that night in that place about 50 miles from Beersheba, where he laid sleeping with a stone near the head of where he slept? Did God manipulate his dreams so that he would, I'm going to move my stool a little bit. Did God manipulate his dreams so that he would better understand the message that he was about to give to Jacob? I think yes. And if that's the case, then what we need to know about this occurrence in verse number 12 is that God is still moving and working on the earth and that the things of earth are being carried up to the throne room of God, and the things from the throne room of God are being carried down to earth. Are they being carried on angels, perhaps? <laughs> By the way, notice that the angels that were ascending and descending needed a ladder. So did they have wings? Well, we know that Isaiah's cherubim had wings, had six wings, in fact. Uh, but do all angels have wings? Oh, the questions that this brings up that we can't fully answer. But I think the one thing that is, is clear, um, and, and it's what I picked up uh, from, uh, I believe it was either, I believe it was John MacArthur's commentary, is that what we're seeing is the fact that God continues to work on this earth. He cares about what's going on. The cares and struggles of the earth are carried to his throne, and from his throne, his love care is given back in return. And another lesson, this part of it, is that the angels are the messengers. The word angel means messenger. Go to the book of Revelation, unto the angel of the church of Sardis. We're talking about a messenger to the church at Sardis, and, uh, and more than likely then, then it's a reference to the pastor at the church of Sardis. Sardis. And so God uses angels, his messengers, is what the word means, to carry from us and carry to us the things that we need to hear and know. And there's a lot of beautiful symbolism in that that we can use without trying to put into it um, uh, uh, drawing the picture and explaining what it all means. 
uh, uh, and how it all looked and, and what it was all about. But if we can know this, that there is a connection between heaven and earth. Is it a ladder? <laughs> I doubt it. But for Jacob, he would understand a ladder. For us, we can understand a rocket ship, a space shuttle. For us, we could under, understand SpaceX One. For us, we can understand an escalator or an elevator. For Jacob, he could understand a ladder, a connection between something far away and high and out of his reach and that connection that brought those things down to his reach. That's what I think we need to see out of this. Uh, rather than trying to see a whole lot of other things happening and a whole lot of stuff that may or may not be part of it. And so in that dream, he dreamed of this ladder and God's continual work. But now I want you to see the more important aspect. I think the dream that he got was not the thing he needed to understand. Uh, when we look at this, the, the, the dream itself helped him understand what God was about to say. And I want to talk about what God was about to say here. Because what God was about to say here was nothing that was new to Jacob. What God was telling him was nothing new to Jacob. And when God speaks to us today, while it may have some different nuances, as we'll see when we get into verse 13 and 14 and 15, there were some nuances that became more applicable to Jacob with the message that he heard. But the message was the same truth that, that God had been telling Abraham and Isaac all along. Now, I want you to get that. I want you to grab that. And when we think we're hearing from God, I want you to be so very careful because there is, listen, there is bad, bad, ugly, evil philosophy being brought in and called the theology. Philosophy is the thinking of man, the wisdom of man. Theology is God's speaking. And there is philosophy being brought. Well, I, I got this new word from God. Oh, my friend, if it does not, co if it does not co coincide and sit with, with no detracting element whatsoever, the current word of God the new word of God is to be suspect. And I need to say that very plainly. If the new word that you think you heard from God is not parallel and proper and, and, and part of the same word from God that we've had all along, it better be suspect in your heart. It better be suspect in your mind. And you better be slow, if ever, to accept it as real truth from God. There is great danger in believing that just anybody can hear anything that will add to what God has already told us. And oh, the danger that is there is heaven and hell. The danger that is there in bringing things to, to, to say, this is a new word from God that does not exist in perfect unity with the word of God that we have. Those dangers can mean somebody's going to spend eternity in hell because they listen to you and your imagination and your dream instead of listening to what God has said. So be careful. Be careful. Be careful with a new word of truth, with a new word of, a phrase that's used today, a new word of knowledge, a new book that might be written, a new, new way to see things or way to consider things. Oh, be so very careful. Have I harped on that enough to know? Mm -hmm. The message that Jacob received was not a new message from God, but it was a message that was given to him from God. And that was the nuance. Here it is, verse 13. Uh, and behold, the Lord stood above it, above what? The ladder. Um, and, uh, and as he stood above the ladder... He said this, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. Notice he called his grandfather his father. And you can see how that's part of it and how that's there. Um, and you can see uh, that, that uh, then that's kind of where we get our, our thoughts of Father Abraham and that kind of thing. And that, that's, that's who's speaking now. So listen to God speak. 
The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I'm with you. I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. There's the message that Jacob got as God used in this dream something to help him understand. I am interacting with this world. I'm God, things are going on in this world that are being brought to me and I'm sending to this world and I'm standing up there and I'm addressing the world to you, Jacob. I want you to hear this. And the words that he gave are the same words that he gave to Abraham and affirmed them to him several times. The same words that he gave to, to Jacob's father, Isaac, and he affirmed them several times. And as he put this together, he said, now I'm going to give it to Jacob. The nuance is that it is through Jacob. Do you, do you know that the chosen people in, pardon me, the chosen people in every generation had to, had to have a single person singled out of that generation to be that person who would be the line of those who was chosen to bring Messiah to, to mankind. And if you go to the genealogies that are in of Jesus, you'll see who that one person is and that next person is and that next person is. And it's going to come back. And when it comes back, it's going to come to Jacob and it's going to come to Isaac and it's going to come to Abraham. Of all of the people in the world, God could have chosen. God chose Abraham and he said, in your seed, in your descendants, this blessing will occur. And of all of the, well, he could have chosen Ishmael or he could have chosen Isaac. But God chose Isaac. Here he could have chosen Jacob or he could have chosen Esau. God chose Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Another, that's another part of the, of the story and that's later down the road. But he could have picked any one of those 12. But it came down to a single person that God said he would use. And it did not come down to a perfect person. Got to be careful thinking about that. To think that the person God uses has to be a perfect person, we, we got to be careful about that. It didn't come down to a person who was the greatest at serving God and all of that. And Jacob was a liar and a thief. Hmm. His father, his his father was um, Isaac was was a, a dishonest man at best, and and he he didn't really do what God said perfectly as he ought to. And Abraham, oh my goodness, look at what Abraham said and did and, and, and all of that. And Jacob, since he's our topic tonight, is a, is a man who got ahead of God and got ahead of what God had promised and did. But God still chose him to use him. It's the same message that we shared a couple of times ago is that God still uses imperfect people. One of the most beautiful examples of that is the way that the crosses were made in the Roman culture, which would come to be the cross upon which Jesus died. They did not take the, the kind of care that we might take today to make a beautiful ornamental cross, which we can display in a place of worship or in our homes. It was not meant to be a symmetrical device of beautifully honed wood. They didn't send it through planers to make everything smooth. They didn't measure it to make sure everything was exactly proportional. They didn't take it uh, through um, a, a special die to make sure that it fit every other cross that was ever made. They had some rough dimensions and they had some rough timbers and they cut them out. Uh, some people indicate that they weren't square like lumber, but they were just limbs of a, a big branches that were still round and still had the bark on them and, and that they just hewed out what they needed to hew out so that they would fit together and do what they needed to do. And, and uh, there, there are different, uh, different depictions of it. I wasn't there a couple thousand years ago, so I'm not sure, but I, I would assume that they didn't take too much care trying to make 
this a pretty and a comfortable piece of wood. It was not meant to be a religious icon. It wasn't meant to be a comfortable resting place. It was meant to be an instrument to put somebody to death in what historically is, as far as I have studied, the, the most torturous, the most disgustingly harsh method of execution by which any man can be put to death. I really don't think they're going to try to make it beautiful or comfortable or smooth or elegant or anything like that because of the nature of what it was. God used an imperfect piece of timber as the instrument to finally pay the price with the Messiah who would be coming down this line to which Jacob has now been assigned, which would pay the price for you and for me that we could know eternal life. And if the inanimate objects of creation are ugly and rough and harsh that God might use, and of course that is some speculation. I don't want to come across as an authority on Roman executions here. But if that's the case, that he would use something less than perfectly fit and put together to accomplish what he wanted to think of what people he would use to help continue the work that God has chosen. Listen, God chooses people like you and I to show up in the lives of people. None of us are perfect. None of us have done it all right. None of us have done it exactly as we should. But all of us can look up and say, Father, would you use me? And he'll look down and say, here's a task. I choose you for that. He looked down at Jacob and he said, here's a task. And, and this is the task. I, I, I'm giving you the task to be one of the patriarchs of this, one of the progenitors for this, for the land that I'm promising to your people, for the descendants that I'm promising to bring Messiah, who will bless all the families of the earth. Choosing you, Jacob. You just got through stealing from your brother and lying to your father and colluding with your mother to do it, thus raising the ire of your brother to the point that he is out to kill you. Listen, Jacob, I'm going to use you. Isn't that good news? Is that great news? Jacob, I'm going to use you. In spite of what you just got done doing, I'm going to use you. How wonderful of a God is that? That's what God said. By the way, in verse 13, I am the Lord God of Abraham. Lord Yahweh, it's the title, it's the name of God. Yahweh is how we say that today. God is Elohim, one of the forms of the word Elohim, which is the same as in Genesis 1-1 in the beginning, God, Elohim. And it's a word that has a plurality to it. So it's a reminder of the unity of the Godhead that would be coming um, uh, in, in, in part of that God, God uh, unity, that triunity of God would come and be Jesus Christ the Messiah, who Jacob was just chosen to be the father of a line of people who would eventually end up bringing to us Messiah. The, 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 the Lord, Yahweh, his name, Elohim, God, his, his, his responsibility, his title, his place. That's who was speaking to him. Well, when we come to verse number 16, I, I probably need to hurry on. We spent a lot of time here. I, I hope God's spoken to you some with that. Um, when we come to verse 16, Jacob now comes and, and wakes up from his sleep. And as he wakes up from his sleep, he, he, he begins to speak. Wow. Surely the Lord, uh, again, uh, Yahweh, surely the Lord is in this place. Uh, and, and I didn't even know it. I thought I was just passing through some land, going to do what mama told me to do. Um, you know, I'm going to go find me a wife in my father's land, in my mother's homeland. Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Can't pass over verse 16 without saying, where is God that we are not capable of knowing that he's there? Where are we when we don't even know that God is there? Have you been in places where it just seems hard to reckon the presence of God in your life? To, it, it's, it's a difficult spot. Is God really here? Some of you have been uh, in, in jail. Is God in the jailhouse? Absolutely. 
Is it hard to tell that he's there? Well, I don't know from experience. Some have told me yes, and some have told me, some have told me no. Uh, I've been in some churches, and I know God's there, but it's hard to tell that God's there. I've been in some homes, and I know God's there, but it's hard to tell that God's there. And in this desolate place that was going to become the promised land, Jacob says, surely the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord is in this place. I did not know it. And because of that, he was afraid. He was filled with awe and there was a fear. Let's not gloss over the fear that comes when we truly know who God is and recognize his presence. Listen, it being in the very actual presence which and recognizing that presence brings to you nothing more than a warm, fuzzy feeling you're probably missing the fullness of the presence of God that he wishes to show you. Because in the presence of God, there is such a reverence that it should bring fear when you realize who he is compared to who you are. Isaiah is a perfect example of that. When the year the king Uzziah died, he saw the Lord high and lifted up and he said, woe is me, fearful for my life. I am nothing, I am dirt. And this one who is here, he can, he can take me down. He is so big. He is so strong. Adam and Eve trying to hide from the presence of God because they knew in the presence of God there was something to be feared because of their sin, which deserved rejection by that very God. And if there is not a fear of that kind of God in your awesome awareness of who he is, you are missing the fullness of who he is in his righteousness and his justice. The Bible says that Jacob was afraid. It said, verse, uh, verse 17, and he was afraid. He said, how awesome is this place? There's none other than the house of God. And, and this is the gate of heaven. <laughs> how interesting is that? So there's a ladder, and, and that ladder there is how we get to heaven. So when we die, we have to be able to climb a ladder and, and, and get to heaven. But it doesn't say that man, mankind was climbing that ladder in the dream. It was the angels who were climbing the ladder in the dream and and obviously we know in scripture that we do not become angels when we pass from death into everlasting, or from life into death and, and everlasting life then. Um, angels are a completely separate created being. And I don't, I don't want to be an angel. I want to be a person who has been redeemed. The angels don't get to be redeemed. I'm a person who has been bought back because of my willfulness and my sin. And I, listen, I'm going to spend eternity with my father because he sent Jesus to pay the price for me, I've been redeemed. I've been bought back. I don't, I don't want to be an angel who can't be redeemed. In fact, the Bible says two-thirds of the angels got swooped out of heaven. And they're not going to have the chance to be redeemed. And they look on us with jealousy because God made us a little lower than the angels, but he made us so that we could be redeemed. Uh, I don't want to be an angel. When it comes my time to die, I want to join the redeemed, that great cloud of witnesses that Hebrews 11 talks about. And I want to be in the presence of God as a loved and chosen vessel that he chose to be with himself and that he paid the price for. Beautiful like that. So he says, this is the gate of heaven. Is it really the gate of heaven or is it just that gate of awareness of the fact that heaven exists and who God is? Well, in verse 18, Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. Um, and we used to think of a pillar as being a big tall thing that holds up the front of Greek buildings, you know, and, and, and that kind of thing. But uh, a pillar didn't have to be that. A pillar could be something very small. It could have been just a very small stone. Certainly it would have needed to be, you know, if he was using it for a bed stone, um, a, a warming stone. It wasn't going to be too huge for him to be able to move over and, and put near his head as he slept. But he set it up as a pillar and he anointed it. He poured oil. He anointed it with oil on the top of it and he called the name of the place Bethel. Uh, but the, the name of the city had previously been Luz. Uh, and uh, so he changed the name of the place. Some historians tell us that there was a little discussion among the people, if you will, about that name change as to whether Jacob really had the right to make that kind of a change and stuff. But I guess you can call a place whatever you want to call a place. And this became a place where God is. And so he did that. That's what Jacob began to share and what Jacob began to say. Now, earlier in the text, verses 13 through 15, 
we saw the covenant words of God. Now we come to verse number 20. And when we get down to verse number 20, we see not the covenant words of God, but the covenant words of Jacob. And so pay attention now to the covenant words of Jacob in verse number 20. Um, then Jacob made a vow. And he said this, uh, pause on that word vow. Listen, a vow is more than just, yeah, I'll see you sometime. If, if you made a vow, I'll see you sometime. You better make sure that you fulfill that vow. I'll see you sometime. God, God blessed me and I got to buy a new truck this week. Well, it wasn't new. In fact, it's pretty doggone old, but it's, it's a teenager by now. But um, the, uh, um, uh, the, the way we did the business in order to make that purchase was not that I went up to the guy and shook his hand and he gave me the keys and I promised him the money. We signed papers. In fact, I signed papers at two different places. And when we got done signing papers and I was ready to drive away, the last paper that I signed was a paper that said that this man from whom I bought the vehicle does not owe me anything else. <laughs> it was a paper I had to sign to say that, that our transaction was complete. It wasn't the as is part. I had to sign one that said I bought the vehicle as it is. But then I had to sign another paper that said, this is a complete, and we had to sign paper after paper, initial here, sign here. You ever bought a house and gone through the mortgage process? On this page, you're initialing that there might be lead paint in the house because it was built before a certain date. On this page, you're initialing that you understand that, that uh, this house is of a certain age and so that it might have, have damage underneath. And on this page, you're signing uh, about the, the terms of the mortgage that you're going to do and how the ownership of the house lays and all of that kind of stuff. And we have to go through all of that. In Jacob's day, it was a word. This is my vow. Sometimes they made the vow, as we saw, uh, with one of, one of his fathers um, in, in very intimate ways. And sometimes they made vows in very dramatic ways with the splitting of animals and the moving of things like that. But, but uh, the, that was just marking the actual agreement was the voice. The vow that was made that says, this is what it will be. And he begins his vow in an unusual way because most of the time, the vow says, I will. And then the other party to the vow says, he will. But God began this agreement, this vow. This, this isn't really a covenant. The covenant was with Abraham, his grandfather. But, but God began it in verse 13 through 15. and says, I'll do all these things for you. And now Jacob, listen to what Jacob said. If God be with me, there's an if in there, that unusual beginning. If God be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Again, Yahweh and Elohim are there. Uh, he said, listen, if God does what he says he will do, then he's going to be my God. Named him Yahweh, titled him Elohim. If if God does these things for me, and listen to what he said, if he keeps me in the way that I'm going, I'm going where I'm supposed to go, and, and he keeps me, and, and, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace. It's what God said he'd do, right? Give you this land, and you come back, and you do all this. If I get back home to my father Isaac, through whom this same covenant was given, I will know, I will understand. He will be my God and he will be the Lord. That's, that's what he said. And the stone which I've set up as a pillar shall be God's house and all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. And he, he promised a tithe. And so we know that that, that that concept of the tenth, that concept of a tithe of things goes all the way back at least to the 28th chapter of Genesis and, and a little bit further back than that. But we know that the promise that was given for that was given by Jacob in this case. If God keeps me, he'll be my God. And I don't think that's a bad way to say it. I don't think it, some people have criticized Jacob on this point. Well, God should just be your God, whether he does those things or not. But listen, for God to be my God, he has to keep my his promises to me or else he's not worthy to be the God that he professes to be. 
And I don't want that to sound harsh or indicting against God, but if God promised that he would never leave me or forsake you and, and he leaves and forsakes me, then, then he's not the God that promised me that he would not leave me nor forsake me. If I come to God and he turns me away, then he's not my God, for he, he's not that God that promised that, because the God that I came to said, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. There's no way I'm going to cast him out, throw him out. If, if this God did not, and, and we now have almost 4,000 or a little more than 4,000 years of history from, from the point that we're reading about tonight, but if he did not fulfill all of, the, all of this, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the way down to Mary and Joseph through Jesus and then through the apostles and then to us, if he hadn't kept all that, then he would not be my Lord. I don't say that as a rebellious word or a presumptuous word. It's just that I would not recognize him as Lord. I wouldn't know who he is. But he has kept his word. He's a God that keeps his promises. He's a God that does all that he says he will do. And he says, listen, I, listen, Jacob, I'm, I'm the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. This land I'm going to give you and to your descendants, and your descendants will be as the dust of the earth. There are going to be a lot of them. That's interesting because uh, um, his father was one of two, and, and uh, Abraham uh, was out there in the middle of nowhere when God gave him that. And then there was Jacob and Esau to begin with on, in, in this case. And, so I'll give you the descendants and all of this land, and I will be with you, and I will keep you wherever you go. He promised that in verse 13, verse 20 and 21. He says, if he does that, bring you back to this land. If he does that, uh, I'll not leave you until I've done what I've spoken. If he does that, if this God who just spoke to me, this God who just manipulated my dream, this God who showed me who he was, this God who says he's the God who promised to my father, this God who says he's the God who promised to my grandfather and, and said that there's some great blessing for all of the earth and a great number of descendants and our name's going to last and all of these things. If he does that, that's my God. That's my God. And if he doesn't, then that's not the God that I was taught to love. That's not the God of my father. That's not my God. And so he's saying, listen, you do the things you said you would do. You prove to me that you're God. Now, God be careful. God be careful. There's a lot of things when we read stories like this in scripture that we have to be very careful concerning. And one of them is this, putting conditions on God. Listen, God would still be God. He would still be the all-powerful, almighty. He would still be the all-knowing, the all-caring, the all-giving, the ever-present one, even if he was not honest and full of integrity. He would be described differently if he were that kind of God, but he would still be God because being God is not a matter of how we perceive him and what we want him to be and what we see in him as much as being God is about being the one who is above all of creation and the creator, beginner, the originator of it all. See, that's who God is. And on top of the fact that he is above and was before in the beginning, First uh, John, uh, uh, John chapter 1 verse 1 says uh, that in the beginning was the Word, or was with God, the Word was God. The implication there is if he was with God in the beginning, then God was also in the beginning. Uh, Gen Genesis 1 1, in the beginning God created heaven and earth. If, if he is that God, then whether he is full of the kind of integrity that we would call for or not, he's still God. But he is further described as one who keeps his word. He is further described as one who punishes sin. He is further described as one who loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He's also not only the God who punishes sin, but he's the God who frees the guilty of sin from their um, responsibility toward the sin that they have, have committed. You see, he's still God. But the Bible goes on to tell us a lot about him that makes him more than the all-powerful, almighty creator of all who was before all and will remain when all that we know has ended. He's still God. 
And Jacob could be saying one of two things here. He could be saying, if he does this, then I'll choose to follow him. Or he could be saying, if he does this, then he's the God. Because only God will be able to do this. And I'll know that he is God. So then I know that it wasn't just a dream that I dreamed of a UFO with a ladder and alien beings crawling up and down and some being of light standing at the doorway of this bright object floating in the sky with, an, uh, with, a, with a ladder coming down speaking to me. I'll know it wasn't that. I'll know it was the God in heaven that my father talked about coming to his tent one afternoon. That, that, uh, that, that, that my grandfather talked about coming to his tent one afternoon. The God that I've heard about all my life. The God who created it all. I, I, I have to land as I study scripture on the ladder. Jacob is not putting a condition on him to say, if you do this, then I'll allow you to be my God. He's saying, if you do this, you will have shown yourself to be my God. I've already got a God. I don't need a new God. And if you do what you said you would do here, if you do this promise that you've made, then you're that God. You're that God. And I don't think there's anything wrong whatsoever. I don't see anything in Scripture that tells us that we're not allowed to say, God, show me. God, God, help me, un help me know you. Help me understand who you are. And for the person whose faith is not in the God that we're talking about tonight, there's nothing in Scripture that would prohibit you from saying, God, show me who you are. In fact, the Word says, if you seek me, you will be found by me. And if you seek for him and you want him to show you who he is, not by some, don't listen, don't, don't, put, a, uh, don't, don't put something on him that's not, not promised to you already. God, if you get me out of jail for this murder that I committed, then, then, then I'll believe who, who you are. He didn't say he would do that. He never said he would do that. So putting that on him would not be, uh, would, would not be a rational thing to do. To say, God, if you fix this thing that I broke... <laughs> He didn't necessarily say he would always fix that. God, if you will heal my, my relative of this terrible whatever it is that they're suffering from, then, then I'll believe it. See, he never said he would heal every single instance of every single disease. The Bible says he'll heal every disease, but I'd say he'll heal every instance of every disease. And so we don't put things on him. But if we say, God, you be who you say you are, I'll understand that I can trust you. There's nothing wrong with that. And if you're trying to figure out this whole God thing in your heart, would you whisper a prayer and say, God, show me that you're who you say you are. Show me that you're who the Bible talks about. I want you to be my God. I want that God to be my God. And he'll hear you. He'll respond to you. He will show you how your sin has broken a relationship with him and how he will forgive you of that simply for the asking. God, I know I've broken your law and that's broken our relationship. Will you forgive me? And he will. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just. He'll forgive us our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, will you help me follow you? I sure will. I won't cast you away. He'll help you. And we here at Second Baptist Church will help you as well to be able to take those next steps to be able to figure out how to do what, what you're needing to do. If you'll just simply decide, I want to follow the God of the Bible. I hope you'll do that. And if you do, please contact us through this forum. On this forum, there are many different ways to contact us uh, here. Uh, uh, there are email addresses. There are private messages. There are, are, are regular comments that you can drop in the place. There are phone numbers on, on the page associated with this um, with this particular broadcast. And so there are a lot of ways that you can use to contact us. I hope you do. Let Second Baptist Church help you with, uh, with next steps. And, and we'd sure be glad to know that. Next Sunday morning, Second Baptist Church will be in our building again at 10 a.m. There we will have, hopefully, um, some, some more specific announcements about how we're going to move forward, what we're going to do for the next few weeks. And uh, you just keep praying for God's leadership. Remember the the uh, prayer event this Saturday, August the 8th in Omogi. 
and hopefully there will be one in a town near or around you mm -hmm. where you can also go praying for our schools. Such an important thing to do. I want to pray with you, and when I'm done praying, we'll be done for the night. Thank you for joining us here at the, this lesson time for Second Baptist Church. We will again be opening the Word, uh, if, if God allows, um, on uh, the, this coming Lord's Day. We will be in the 29th chapter of Genesis. And we will be looking mm -hmm. at one of the, what I, what I think, the strangest <laughs> pursuits of, of a wife uh, in Scripture when we begin to look and see how Jacob finally gets his wife, Rachel. Well, let me pray with you, and we'll be done tonight. Thank you so much, God, that you love us enough to remind us over and over again as we read account after account in your word of how you showed people who you are and gave them the ability to believe in you. I pray for those who aren't quite sure yet that you would, you would help them understand how much you love them and help them get to a place where they can uh, follow you and serve you and draw them to a place where they will, will ask you to forgive them. And, and Father, even some who may be hearing me right now father touch their hearts and help them to know that they can can, can receive your love that you are the god that, that we're reading about tonight and even some four thousand years later you still reach out to people and you still love people thank mm -hmm. you for that we thank you father for those uh, among our congregation especially some have finished surgeries today and, and came out pretty well on that and have some rehab to do we pray for them some are, are still looking at uh, whether or not uh, this COVID thing has hit them. Father, I pray that you would uh, be mightily seen as you deal with that in, in those things. And Father, in all of the stuff that we see, all the, the, the dangers that we face, all of the disappointments, the little things and big things that happen to us, I ask God that just as clearly as you showed yourself to Jacob in this account which we read tonight, that you would show yourself to us and help us know who you are. Help us love you more. And help us resolve even more strongly to follow. For I pray in the wonderful name of the answer to the covenant that you made with Jacob that day. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you Sunday. I hope. And if not in the building, we will be right here on social media. And as long as our internet holds up. All right. God bless you guys, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye.